Well, hello and welcome back to Supposedly Fun. My name is Greg. Now, before we begin, I need to note we are having our fence replaced, so there is some construction going on outside. If you hear noises, Jamie, the one who usually barks of, of my two dogs, is kind of prowling around listening to the noises, so there may be a little bit of barking and growling or construction noise, just FYI. But we are here today because we are halfway through 2020 already. Can you believe that? I can't. So I wanted to do a video about some of my favorites of 2020 and some of my least favorites of 2020. I covered some of this in the mid-year book freakout tag, which I will link down below, but I wanted to more specifically talk about just some favorites, not not come at it from just that perspective and, and do that. And it's my channel, so you know, I get to do what I want and that is what is fun about it. Now I'm gonna do things a little differently. I wanna talk about the ones that are least favorites because I did cover these a little more specifically on in the mid-year book freak out tag. I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on them and then we'll build to what is so far my favorite book of the year. And let's start with The Glass Hotel by Emily St. John Mandel. This was just a big disappointment. I was only okay with Station Eleven. I thought there were some structural problems with that book and I just did not like this one at all. And this was a buddy read with Britta Bowler and she felt the same way. It feels like nothing happens. There are really bad plotting decisions. It felt to both of us like Emily St. John Mandel was a debut novelist, kind of struggling to figure out how to put a whole bunch of ideas in a book. And she's not a debut novelist. This is like her fifth or sixth novel. And I think if she had chosen just one of her storylines and decided that that would be it, the book might have been okay. But you know, Station Eleven had the same thing, really sprawling narratives. Um, but it managed to tie them all together much better than this one did. It was just, to me, a disappointment. So that's Station Eleven. And then there was Cloud Street by Tim Winton. This is something that, he, Tim Winton had been on my radar, but I particularly wanted to get to him because my reading challenge to myself for 2020 is to read outside your comfort zone. The main idea of that is to read books outside of genres that I have, that I traditionally read, and to try to read more authors outside of the United States uh, or North America and Europe. Tim Winton is Australian, so he fits that brief, and I had never read him before. And I was, I've heard very good things about him as a writer, so I was really looking forward to it, and I just did not like his writing. I, have, I had a lot of problems with this book in particular, but it was mostly the writing. I just didn't get along with it. I may at some point try another book of his, but it's going to take a lot to get me back in the headspace where I would be willing to go in. I just did not enjoy this very much at all. So that's Cloud Street. Then there's The Far Field by Maduri Vijay. This is another one that I had high hopes for, and I read it for the first round of the Book Two Prize when I was reading fiction books, and I just didn't like it. I thought, again, I thought the plotting was very bad. The characters do things that don't make sense. They make decisions that deliberately put them in danger or make them feel oblivious and they'll arbitrarily change their whole life, and I, I just did not believe it at all. It kind of feels like random acts of plotting in order to put pieces on a board to make... A, it's trying to make them do things to show a larger story about India and Kashmir, and it just felt clumsy to me. I could see where somebody would read this and like it, it just was not for me. And then there's a book that I do not have a copy of, it's Where Reasons End by Yu Yi Yun Lee, which was also a book for the first round of the book two prize and I actually didn't get along with a couple of the books in that round but this one in particular graded on me because it hits a very specific pet peeve of mine with literature which is that I don't like performative therapy and th that book is very much that. Yi Yoon Lee had a son who committed suicide and Where Reasons End is a novel about a mother conversing in her own mind with her son who has committed suicide. And I don't want to be insensitive. I can see where writing something like that would be extremely valuable to Yi Yoon Lee. I did not like it. And I feel like some very much, even though some of those exercises may be therapeutic to the person writing them, it doesn't feel right to read them. It feels very, it feels like you're sitting in on someone else's therapy session and you don't belong there, which is something that really bothers me. And it also starts to feel like when you're in that position, things that seem profound to you may seem obvious to other people who are outside of the situation that you're in. I just don't like it. I, I had a similar problem with Motherhood by Sheila Hetty. It's, ju it's just not a book that's for me. So that is what it is. I am not going to be counting 
The Turn of the Key by Ruth Ware or The Silent Patient by Alex McKillady's, both books that I started and did not finish. I got further into The Silent Patient, but I didn't, I, I was not liking it. They both fall into the trap of the mystery thriller cliches that I don't like, and I just could not deal with them. So because I didn't, especially The Turn of the Key, I did not get very far in, so I'm not going to count them, but they were negative reading experiences. So for what it's worth, I figured I would mention that, but also know that I didn't finish them. With that out of the way, let's get to the positives. Let's talk about some of the good books. And I'm going to start with the very first book that I finished in 2020. It's Little Women by Louisa May Alcott. This was another buddy read with Britta Bowler. And I had not read this book. Uh, my sister read it when we, were, when we were kids, like many women in this country do. And I never wanted to read it because I thought, it's a girl book. I don't want to do that. I'm not a girl. <laughs> and... Shame on me, because I actually really enjoyed it. This book holds up really well, and it's very smart. It has a lot to say about the role of women in society, the role of, say, religion in society, and the expectations. And I actually particularly liked the second half of the book, which very much deals with how, as you grow up, you have expectations for what your life will be. And then in the second half of the book, the March sisters have to deal with the difficulties of those realities or of enacting those dreams. And I just thought it was really smart, very well done. I really enjoyed it. It does have a sort of episodic structure. At times, it does feel like a series of stories meant to teach morals to young people, which is probably why it has such a standing as like a book that young girls read. But I think it manages to get at a lot of profound truths within that structure and do a lot of very smart things. I really enjoyed it a lot, and I'm glad that I finally got around to reading it. That is Little Women. Next is another book to prize book. I had a lot more luck when I did the nonfiction round in the uh, second round of the book to prize. And I have a couple of books that I really enjoyed while I was doing that. The first one is A Woman of No Importance by Sonia Parnell. This is the story of, oh god, I'm blanking on her name, Virginia Hall, who wanted to do a lot of things. She wanted to be a diplomat, but she was not given a chance. She ends up working as a spy in World War II, and her story is just fascinating, and it's written in the style of a thriller, and I know some people think that is a negative. To me, this is exactly the kind of book that proves that narrative nonfiction can be perfect. I really enjoyed this book a lot. It, I read it at the very end of the round, so I was stressed that I had to fit one more book in before turning in my ballot, and it was so compulsively readable that I had absolutely no problem getting it in in such a short time frame. And I'm actually thinking about reading Sonia Purnell's other book, which is Clementine, The Life of Mrs. Winston Churchill. I, I, I would recommend it, and I hope that this book does go far in the Book 2 Prize. Another uh, book from the round of the Book 2 Prize was Sea People by Christina Thompson. I do not own a copy. I listened to the audio of it. And I recommend the audio because the narrator has this wonderful voice. She does a great job in, in narrating it. She's very engaging and draws you into the story. I have heard other people comment to say, don't, no, 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 don't miss out on the print book because the print book has a lot of really great photos in it. So I will leave it up to you to decide which is more important to you. But this was just a really great book exploring a subject that I didn't know anything about, which is something I really enjoy in nonfiction. And it's why, a reason I seek out nonfiction a lot. I want to be taught something that I didn't know before and I didn't know anything about this. So it's about Polynesia and how it was settled or how it could have been settled because we don't have a whole lot of answers on topics like this and how people moved from island to island and it is also very much in a more subtle way about colonialism and the impressions that white people who moved into the area had of the people and how they moved around and how those misperceptions shaped our understanding of their history. It's a fascinating book and I, I just really enjoyed it. The other book that I had put in the top three in that round was The Only Plane in the Sky by Garrett M. Graff. And as much as I, th I, I worked to advance that book, it is still in, in the Book 2 Prize uh, at the moment for consideration in the next round, the current round, before, uh, which is the one before the finals. I, uh, I really struggled with whether or not to include it in my favorites, and I ultimately decided not to. But I guess maybe like an honorary mention since I'm talking about it now. Because I got something out of it. It forced me to reflect on my own reaction to 9-11 and why it's such a difficult subject matter for me. 
especially in literature. And as much as unpleasant as it was for me to deal with that, I got a lot out of it. So I feel like I have, I'm mentioning it here, but let's consider it like an honorary mention at the end. And the book that I gave first place to when I judged nonfiction in the last round of the Book Two Prize was The Heartbeat of Wounded Knee by David Troyer. I really enjoyed this book. And so much of it is that, you know, we all take our personal baggage into books that we read with us. And I have learned a lot about Native culture and the way in which Native cultures have lived for over the last century. David Troyer took the idea that uh, The Heartbeat of Wounded Knee is a book that is commonly taught and it treats Native history as if it ends with Wounded Knee. And it very much does not. A lot happens after that. And he goes into the rest of that history and all of the things that happen, many of which are very sad, and the ways in which Native people have continued to be kept down uh, perpetually. And, I, I, you know, for me... Uh, I, I, I can't talk about my foster son too much. My foster son is Native American, so I've had to help him navigate a lot of those things. So maybe it's that personal angle that made it very relevant to me. But I just really, uh, as, as depressing and difficult as the subject matter is, it just resonated with me and I, I really enjoyed it. So had to mention that one as well. Getting back into the realm of fiction, so as part of my Read Outside Your Comfort Zone challenge, I mentioned that I want to read books outside of genres that I would traditionally read. As part of that, I wanted to read a manga. And my general approach to this is to pick books within a genre that sound like they would appeal to me. So I found a manga called My Brother's Husband by Gungori Tagami. There's volume one and two. It is about Mike, who is a Canadian, who shows up unexpectedly at the doorstep of the brother of his deceased husband. And he wants to get to know where his husband came from. And through him, uh, the brother of, of his husband, is forced to confront his relationship with his brother. It is such a good book. I really enjoyed it. Loved it very much. I talked about the, this a lot for several of the prompts in the mid-year book freakout tag, so I won't go into it too much here. But... I really enjoyed the experience of it and the stories and I, I, if you were looking for a manga, I would definitely recommend this one. I may try to, I may still try to read a more traditional manga, but I'm also thinking at this point we're halfway through the year and I still have some other genres to get to and continents to get to. Uh, so I, and, and, and bits of the prompt to get to, so I may leave that off and focus on some other things. Another genre I don't traditionally read is a Western. I read True Grit by Charles Portis. I listened to the audio, and the audio is narrated by Donna Tartt, the author of The Goldfinch, and she does a great job. She's a huge fan of the book True Grit, and she does a really great job with the audio, and I really enjoyed the story. So if you're unfamiliar, if you haven't seen either of the movie versions or read the book before, it is about Maddie Ross, who was a 14-year-old girl, very headstrong, very stubborn. She, her, her father is murdered and she wants revenge. So she hires uh, a man named Rooster Cogburn, who she hears has true grit. And she wants him to get revenge for on behalf of her family. And she insists that because she is paying, she should go along on the journey. And Maddie Ross is such a vivid character. I, re I think she's a character that is going to stay with me for a very long time. And part of that, I think, is Donna Tartt's reading of the audiobook. And also, Rooster, I mean, Rooster Cogburn is a very dynamic character. You can see why he is a character that has won John Wayne an Oscar in 1969 and got Jeff Bridges nominated for an Oscar in 2010. I, I, you can see the appeal of the character, but really it's Maddie Ross for me. She's such a great character, and I really enjoyed the book. And it was a great, that was kind of the starting point for my Read Outside Your Comfort Zone challenge, and it was just a great launch pad for it because it showed... Without a, sh without a shadow of a doubt that I could enjoy these genres that I don't traditionally engage with. And that was further proven when I read Lonesome Dove, which, of course, is a Western. It was the Pulitzer Prize winner for 1986, published in 1985. I did a very long, a longer form review of this as part of my Pulitzer Prize project. It launched that for me. I will link the video down below. And if you're unfamiliar, if you didn't see my review, you haven't seen the TV movie version of it, this is the story of a cattle drive from Texas up to Montana... And what is really good about this book is that it subverts a lot of the classic Western tropes and cliches 
by inhabiting the form of a Western. And I think that's really smart. And I think this book does a lot of very subtle things that call into question a lot of the myth-making around the Old West. And I really enjoyed it. I'm not going to say a whole lot about it because, as I said, I have a long video of, that, that is a specific review of it. I will link it down below. And Larry McMurtry is now an author that I am looking forward to exploring more of. I hope to read The Last Picture Show, which is a semi-autobiographical novel of his. I think that's very interesting. And of course, he wrote Terms of Endearment, and I'm kind of looking forward to reading that as well. He has some very dynamic, strong female characters, so Terms of Endearment is particularly of interest to me after this. And I'm really looking forward to getting to know his writing a lot more. My fa So Lo Lonesome Dove is actually my runner-up for favorite book of the year so far. My favorite book of the year so far is Song of Solomon, which was also one of the first books I read this year. This was a buddy read with Amelia Reads, who is a commenter. And it's going to be very hard for any book to top this this year. And it was one of the first books I read. It's, it's a, a very interesting position to be. But I just loved this book on so many different levels. If you're not familiar, it's the story of Milkman Dead. And it's about his family and his relationship with himself and his journey of self-discovery. And it's more deeply about the trauma of slavery, like the lasting trauma of slavery, and how it continues to inflict trauma on people and rob them of their identities and their lives and their relation to, to other people. It's such a good book. Amelia and I read this one chapter at a time, and I think that was a really great way to do it because after every chapter, we stopped and we reflected on what Toni Morrison was doing. And I think a really great example of that is that in her foreword, Toni Morrison, at least of this version, Amelia's version did not do this, Toni Morrison dissects the first sentence. And the first sentence of the book is... The North Carolina Mutual Life Insurance agent promised to fly from Mercy to the other side of Lake Superior at 3 o'clock, which sounds not, not very notable. However, in the foreword, Toni Morrison very much explains why every single word in that sentence was very deliberately chosen so it would form a mission statement for what she was doing for the book. And I think knowing that as we were going chapter by chapter really allowed me to explore what she was doing and how even things that don't seem intentional are intentional and it's she has, has a poet's precision for crafting the book so if you have this version of the book definitely read the forward for a full understanding of it it's so good and i i can't imagine that any book will beat this in 2020 I had only read one Toni Morrison book before she died last year, and since then I read The Bluest Eye, and now I've read Song of Solomon. And I just, as as I get to know her writing more, I have even more profound respect for her as a writer. She did not publish her first novel until she was about 38, which is my age right now. And she just emerged fully formed as a writer, knowing exactly what she wanted to say and how she wanted to say it. I, Deep respect. I would also very much recommend looking for the documentary of her. I think, what is it? The Pieces I Am? I think Something like that. It's so good. I, so much respect to Toni Morrison. I don't know if any book will top this. Interestingly, last year, when I did my mid-year check-in, my two favorite books of the year were A Fine Balance by Rahint and Mystery and A Place for Us by Fatima Farheen Mir Mirza. And both of those were my two favorite books at the end of the year. So it's going to be very interesting to see if history repeats. And these are still my two favorite books at the end of 2020. As much as I love Lonesome Dove, I feel like there's potential for its spot to be usurped. It's going to be very difficult for anything to take Song of Solomon's place. So we'll see what happens. We have six months to go. A little less. It's We're already into July. So those are my favorites and some of my least favorites from 2020 so far. I've already gotten a bit of a sense of, of, of what your favorites and least favorites have been for this part of the year uh, on my bid year book freak out tag, but I'd love to hear them. If you didn't comment on that video, drop those down below. I, I, I find it very fascinating. If you have other recommendations, I'm going to try to focus a little bit more hard on my read outside your comfort zone challenge in the last part of the year, because there are just, uh, in my head, I'm being really ambitious and I have a lot of areas that I want to hit. 
So I'm going to try to focus on that. If you have recommendations for anything, I'm still accepting them because I still haven't decided on how I'm going to meet a couple of the briefs. But I've, I've gotten a lot of feedback that I've appreciated and I'm just trying to go through it and sort through. So anyway, let me know how the first half of 2020 has been for you. If you're still quarantining, good for you because <laughs> we need to be doing a lot more of that for the last part of this year to start turning things around. It's a little dicey out there. I still have my pride stash. I'll probably be keeping it for the summer and then maybe go to a goatee in the fall. I don't know. I haven't decided yet. You don't need to give me thoughts about that. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, I really appreciate your time always. Any comment, time, likes, subscribes, whatever. I really appreciate all of that. It, it really makes having this channel worthwhile. I am now a year and a half into having a channel and I'm just Really glad that I took the leap and did it. So thank you for making it a wonderful experience. And as always, I will be back until next time. Happy reading.